All right, classmates, questions, comments, concerns? We're, uh, we're sailing through this term. So for some of you that have missing grades, remember everything is on angel. So you can't say, oh, I didn't know I was missing something. It's right there if you are. So catch up quickly so you can have a relaxed spring break. You need at least the second half of it to sober up from the first half of it anyway. So uh, it's not where it's not the way you want to spend your spring break, I don't think. So get caught up, stay caught up, do all right. Any questions before we get going? All right. Uh, yesterday we had a problem. We'll take it up again here in a slightly different form. We had uh, one of my one of my my personal rocket ships. <coughs> uh, had a certain mass. Also had a certain um, thrust to it. I think I called that T. Is that right? I think. So that'll work three times ten to the fifth. Newton. Now, as we go through this stuff, now that things are changing a little bit, we only have four things, the whole four weeks coming up here, and now we're adding more stuff as we go along. One of the things I'm going to expect you to do as we go along is recognize what we're talking about, what the quantity is, in terms of what the units are. I won't always make it so obvious as to say M equals, so that you know that's the mass. I might just say a 20,000 kilogram rocket ship. You have to know from that wording that that's the mass you were given, not the weight. What's the difference between mass and weight? Weight includes uh, the acceleration of gravity. Weight's important. Weight is the gravitational force on an object that object being of mass, M, whatever that is, in a gravitational field, which we designate with G. Now, we typically take G to be 9.81 meters per second squared. It does not mean the object's actually moving at that acceleration. You are subject to this very same relationship. You have a weight because you have mass in a gravitational field but you're not accelerating right now. Some of you, in certain ways, are decelerating right now. Feeling it, Joey? Yeah. Yeah, because because we're past noon on Wednesday, so we're heading downhill. Decelerating. So don't take it means that that is your acceleration. It is. It's the gravitational field strength giving us an idea of what the gravitational force is on you in that gravitational field. You go to some other planet, which some of you seem to do frequently, that G will change because it depends upon the Earth. Also, it depends upon, if you remember what we were looking at in some of the earlier chapters, uh, where you are on the Earth and even the altitude above the Earth, the higher altitude you go, in general, the less the gravitational field strength. So we use that to calculate weight, but this will have units of meters per second. That will have units of kilograms. And that will have units of newtons. Which we, because we're lazy but efficient, just write N. We don't write out the word newton. Too much writing. They pick the hate the right, so so we don't do it. We don't have to. So starting up here, yeah, I'll put m equals for you, so you know that means mass. T, I don't know. Maybe you have to think about what that might stand for. I could have put f because it is a force. Uh, I might have put f sub t, meaning it's a thrust force. Those kind of things you can do. Uh, like the origin, it's optional what you use for these variable designations. I try to do something that's both simple and clear. So instead of putting F sub T, it makes sense to me to just put T. Paying attention to that being a force, 
even so, it's got to be a force because it's got units of force. So start start gathering this stuff. Start becoming more conversant with it. Uh, in some ways, part of what you're doing here is learning a little bit of a language you may not have spoken before. You're, I'm trying to teach you uh, some of the language that we use in science, whether it's written or verbal or, or arithmetic, algebraic, and calculus aic. Write that, take notes, write down what I say. All right, so we had that problem yesterday. What do we have to, oh, we had to find the acceleration, and we did so. Uh, how do we do so? How did we find the, oh, is that the acceleration right there? That would be the acceleration of an object in free fall, an object where the only force is gravity. And we're going to talk in a little bit about why there's another force on you right now that's preventing you from being in free fall. What do we use? What do we use when there's more than one force, uh, more, than, more than the gravitational force acting on something to figure out what its acceleration is? We've got mass, we've got something about the force there we wanted to figure out what the acceleration is. What do we use? Phil? Yep. All right. He said he said F net equals who? Uh, mass times the acceleration. Um, this is incomplete. Good start. <laughs> you get the rest of the day off because you gave us a real good start, but it's incomplete. You should be sitting there going, oh, fix it, quick. You, you're, you, if you're going to be good engineers, which some of you want to be, you've got to have this, this anal retentive thing, this compulsive disorder dwelling up in you that you can't stand to see something on the board that's not right. Phil, you would have given me more if I'd given you more time? That's why your skin's not crawling right now? Don't you have that 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 ooky feeling? It's just not right. Don't leave it like that. Some of you don't look like you're feeling ooky. No, oh, Billy, you do. That's you just kind of an ookiness about you. An aura of ooky. Lem's doing his best to suppress it, but he feels it. What's wrong? This is a vector equation. Force is a vector, and acceleration is a vector. Uh, we can't have an equal sign if we don't have equal things on either side of it. So we've got to have both sides being a vector, if it is and it is in this case. Uh, if you don't believe force is a, a vector, well, of course it is. You push left on something, it's very different than if you push down on something. Even with the same amount of force, you push, push in different directions, different things are going to happen. Um, uh, Phil gave me this F net. It's a little bit different than I personally choose to write. This is perfectly fine. It's just not what I choose to write. So what's another option for writing instead of F net? The summation. I like to do that just as a reminder that we've got to add up all the forces in a problem. So we've got this thrust driving this rocket ship up. That's a force. If we divide it by the mass which we got, we should get the acceleration, shouldn't we? Is that what we did yesterday? Or uh, on Monday? I don't think that's what we did on Monday. Don't make me go back and check the tapes in front of a court of law. We did. There. What forces do we have to put in this summation? Every single possible little force there is? Force acting on the object. 
Well, there's lots of forces acting on the oxygen. It's made up of a bunch of atoms, and all those atoms are working on each other, and all the nuclei are working on all the electrons, and, and the nuclei, the, the neutrons are working on the protons, and there's all kinds of happy stuff going on in there. Do we need all those forces? Well, we'd drive ourselves crazy if we had to take into account the forces, all the atomic and nuclear forces. We can't, those, those in fact are all forces inside the thing. None of those forces are coming from outside acting on the object. None of those forces are going out in any way acting on, those are all internal forces. And in fact, those all cancel each other. Remember we talked about Newton's third law a little bit on Monday, the action-reaction pair. Is this an object, uh, a force on one, from one object on another gets an equal and opposite force back on itself. Remember that? We talked about it a little bit. We'll hit it some more in a second. Well, that's what's going on with, with all the electrons and the neutrons and all that stuff. As a nucleus pulls on an electron, the electron pulls on the nucleus with an equal and opposite force, and those two forces cancel out each other. So that's why we don't have to worry about those. They're internal. They always come in an equal and opposite pair. They always cancel each other out, so let's not mess with them. But this thrust isn't that way. This is a force on the rocket that isn't canceled by anything directly, so we have to account for it. But, do the math real quick. Take this force, divide it by m, and we don't get the acceleration we got on Monday. It was 5.1, wasn't it? 5.2. You divide this force by that mass, just like we could do here, we don't get this acceleration. Did we goof up on Monday? It happens. It's pretty easy to goof up at the board. Are you checking it? Check it for us, Joey. 3 times 10 to the 5th divided by 20,000. You don't get that. You can just do it in your head. Uh, 300,000 divided by 20,000 is is about what? About so how come we don't get the same numbers now that we got on Monday? Yeah, check your notes. I don't have all the forces on this picture that were in this problem. And we can't do this until we have all the forces in the problem. All the, what did I call them? All the, what did I say? I said something about what forces to use. Huh? I said something, I think. Check your notes. Did you write it down? Who's my favorite student that takes good notes? No? Uh, in forces. this case, it, we could call that the Y code. But, but I said something else. All the real forces. Huh? Um, of course they got to be real. <laughs> you guys have so many imaginary forces going on in your head, we'd never finish a problem. All the forces. Uh, yeah. The forces, like you think, oh, i got to get a new cell phone. That's a force on your life. That doesn't count here. That's not the kind of stuff we're at. Yet, it, it accelerates you in a certain way. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about real forces. All the forces on the object. Yeah, all the forces on the object because we don't want forces on something else to help us figure out how the rocket's going to accelerate. That wouldn't make any sense. It's got to be the forces on the rocket. But I did use a word. <coughs> Excuse me. All the <coughs> forces. External. Did I say external? I think I said something else. Yeah, they got to be external because I just talked about the fact all the internal forces cancel each other out in, a, in pairs. All the molecular, all the nuclear forces we don't care about. Vector forces. Uh, force is a vector anyway, so that's that's absolutely vital. 
but I wouldn't have said it. Uh, uh, step, I'm looking for. I did say something else here. Uh, no, maybe I didn't. I, I'm pretty sure. I thought I said it. Um, in dynamics, we're doing kind of the same thing in parallel that we do in here as we go along. It's just in dynamics, we do it in great, much greater depth. So I may have said it there, and I didn't say it here. All the pertinent forces. Did I not use that term for you? Okay, there you go. All the pertinent forces. All the ones that matter. <coughs> there might be other forces in a problem. They just don't matter. Uh, getting, uh, judging whether a force is pertinent or not may take a little practice as we go along. Uh, a good example, if we have some object sitting on a frictionless surface, sitting on ice that is then greased, sprayed with silicone, and, and, then, and then you rubbed it with your hair. That, made, that makes that slippery. If we push on something like that, its weight is not necessarily a pertinent force. Because it's that way, the object can only move that way, so the weight may not be a pertinent force. We might need the weight to figure out what the mass is and then figure out how it's accelerating, but the weight does nothing in terms of the acceleration directly itself. So there are times when certain forces are in a problem, certain values may be part of a problem, but they might be impertinent to the acceleration, to the summation that we're doing here. So what's missing here, Alan? I think you said it a long time ago. The weight. We also have weight in this problem acting down. We know the mass. We know G. We can figure out what the weight is. Once we have the weight, it kind of makes sense, I think, that the thrust is working against the weight. And so we have to use the two of them together to find out the acceleration. All right, so that's what we did on Monday, right? All right, we're going to add to this problem a little bit. A little bit later in the flight. Same thrust, same engine, still, still squirting along at the same amount. But now the acceleration... is 6 meters per second. Was 5.2, not 6. Neglecting air resistance, which we will do in almost all of our problems. So I'll say that right now. Neglecting air resistance. Why would the acceleration change? Huh? What do you mean a decrease in weight? They, they open the door, kick my brother-in-law out. I would. Tried to do it in the car once. Grabbed on, held on. They poked me in the eye. Wasn't even fair. Why, Tyler? Yeah, it's burning up fuel. The ship is getting lighter. So if there's still the same thrust, but it's losing mass because it's burning fuel and squirting it out the tail, its mass is going to be less. How much less? In fact, you figure out for me what's the change in mass? In other words, how much fuel has it burnt by the time it reaches an acceleration of six? NASA does this on launches. They check the measured acceleration against the expected rate at which fuel is burning. Make sure they've got the 
the, all the right values as things are going along. So I want you to find the change in mass. How much fuel was burned? Got it already? Len? Don't say it. Just say yes or no. Huh? Yes. You think so? Joey, you got it? You stopped working? Yeah. What's you think you got it? What's the first acceleration find? First acceleration uh, that we had on Monday right at takeoff, full fuel tanks, was 5.2. Do you need that number? I don't think you need that number. Plus, we're doing the same problem. So if you get an answer, find somebody else who has an answer, see if you got the same thing. Good, uh, good engineering uh, expectation. Is, uh, ask for a second opinion when you can. You can on tests. You can in here, you can on homework. Joey's trying to see if we can remember anybody's name. Anybody? What's his name? What's his name? You're wrong. It's not. What's his name? John. Okay, good. You can ask John. Or you can introduce yourself. No, he doesn't look at me. He didn't want to play, does he? So, you're... You're, you're trying to be friendly, but, but Chris won't let you. Same time, Chris, anyway. Thing to do, we've got acceleration, we've got thrust. You can find out the weight now, find out the mass now, find out what the change in mass was. So you don't need the original acceleration. You do need the original mass because you want to find out the mass changed. Did you get something? Is your name Chris? Somebody's name is Chris? Joey? I don't know. Is it any of you like to be Chris? All your folks get your name changed? Now you got something, Len? You know who Len is? You just know he's back there somewhere. Because I keep looking over your head when I talk to Len. Maybe there's no one there and I'm just faking you out. Got a number, Mike? Check with somebody. Do you know who Len is? Check with Len. No? That's better. Ah, uh, it's Phil. I know. I made it wrong turn, so. <laughs> Good thing you were in your car. find delta m. Let's see, delta means 2 minus 1. We have mass 1. That was mass of takeoff, 20,000 kilograms. We need to find mass 2 now. Anybody agree yet? Len, did he agree with you? Was he wrong? Probably. Got something? Nobody talking to you? Then check with Len. Check with Joey. Joey, what you get, bro? Joey, what's his name? Nothing. God, Joey. Come on, man. Everybody, does anybody not know Joey's name? <laughs> Joey, everybody knows your name. Do you know my name? Second class with me. 
Actually, it's <coughs> third, because you're in IDD as well. You didn't know there. Check with John now. There's the one name you know. Anybody who checked, did you and uh, Alan agree? I started over. Evidently, you didn't agree because why else would you start over? And, and Tyler's not playing with anybody. He's not being any fun, is he? Come on, Tyler. His calculator. He needs to boot up his calculator. It's too much of a pain. Here, here's a big idea, man. Yeah, yeah, you know. Gosh, we're doing the same problem. Should get the same answer. You guys agree? Andrew, do you agree with Mark? No. Joey's going. God, all these names, people. I'm out. There's an Andrew on that. Mark and Tyler and I don't even know half these people. Nobody agreed yet. All right, let's see. Let's let's do it here together. See if we can agree. We need to find M two. M one we were given. That's the way to take off or the mass to take off. So we already had the 20,000 kilograms. If we can find M2 now, the mass now, that goes with this acceleration, under the same thrust as before, we could find delta M. So we need to find M2 to find delta M. Let's see. We need to sum the forces to get the acceleration. We have a new acceleration because we're accelerating a new mass. Is the sum of the forces the same as it was on Monday? And that's the only thing that's changed. Is this, I, the, I said the thrust is the same. Is the sum of the forces the same? Why not? So the weights change because the mass has changed. It could even be that the, this rocket's high enough, now G has even changed, but I'm, I'm not pushing my luck here in terms of what we can do on hand. So, let's see. Uh, I think we picked up as positive, just uh, because we got forces in different directions. So we've got T, which remains the same, minus W2, because they're in opposite directions. My recommendation to you is do these directions algebraically as you go. So I put this minus sign in here indicating that the weight is down. That way every time I put in weight, I have a positive weight, which makes more sense. Have you ever gotten on the scale and had negative weight? You may have lost some weight, but your reading was never negative. So it just makes sense to, to leave the values positive and do the minus signs algebraically going to cause whatever mass it is we're looking for to go the acceleration that I gave you. That's what this is here, this A2 we can call it now. And M2 appears in two places. It's already here because that's the mass we're accelerating, but it's in here because the thrust has to push against the weight. So we've got all of those numbers in except M2 and should have come up with an M2 of what? May I have it? Phil, is that a hand up? Yeah. Samantha, you have it? Okay. Oops, that's not what I had. Phil, what'd you have? Uh, 19,000. Yeah, that's what I am. So check your numbers. It may be a minus sign or something. M2, remember in here. Well, let's see. Uh, 
W2 is M2G, so we can make this T equals M2 times A2 plus G. Is that the right algebra? Or M2 equals the thrust we're given, taking the thrust to be the same, same engines, run under full power, divided by A2 plus G. Is that what worked? Phil, that's what worked? That's what you did? Samantha, did you catch something? Would you have a, maybe a minus sign? A lot of students think the accelerations in the opposite direction of G, how come there's a plus sign here? Well, there's a plus sign because this worked out. These are not vectors here that we're adding. This is just um, quantities that we're adding right there algebraically. So don't put in a minus sign when one isn't there. And you should get just under 19 kilokilograms. Samantha, did you catch it now? Okay. Alan, got it? Got Mark? It. No? Yeah. yeah? Very convincing. So the change in mass then burned about a thousand kilograms of fuel so far. All right. That's that's about as simple as they're going to get because they're going to get more complicated from here. Because you're smarter now. You're smarter now than you were Monday. So let's keep going. All right. I can erase this. Start clean. Are you okay? Sure. All right. I told you, and I hope you believe me, whether you may have put it to use yet, that one of the most useful tools in doing these problems, and it will be so for the rest of the term, for those of you continuing on in engineering who will have statics in the fall and dynamics and mechanics materials in the spring, this will continue to be true. So let's get a handle on this now while we can. That's this business of drawing free body diagrams. There are very few problems you should do for me for the next year and a half that don't have a free body diagram with them. That's part of why I even started doing that course we have, the technical freehand sketching course, is to help with this. It's that important. Free body diagram. It's a simple and large if they're too small they're not going to be helpful after this. Once you've drawn it and then have to do something with it. If you've done it too small, it's not going to be helpful. So why do it? You've got to make them big enough because there's more stuff we got to get in there once we've drawn the basic free body diagram. We need to use it to help us solve the problems. And if you make it too small, it's not going to help. Make it simple because you don't want to waste your time on the drawing. Don't put in windows and bumpers and, and decals and paint jobs and the like. Just make it nice and simple so you can get to the physics stuff, finish that early, catch an earlier flight to Daytona Beach. So make them large and simple. Just the object undergoing the forces. So if we're talking about a simple problem like a crate on some greasy ice, which we are pushing across the ice. Very simple problem. When I go to draw the free body diagram, 
I draw the object we're pushing with the forces free of anything else, free even of the ground. It's just, I'm not push, I'm not accelerating the ground, I'm trying to accelerate the object itself. So just the object, that's the free part. Just the object, free of anything else. If there's a rope attached to it and somebody's pulling on the rope, I don't draw the rope. Just the object, free of everything else. Um, and then I need to put down on it as accurately as possible. The more accurate you do this, the more helpful this drawing is going to be. If you're sloppy about it, that's the kind of help you're going to get from it. Sloppy help. All pertinent forces. You might not know yet if a force is pertinent or not, but that's fine. As you go through the calculation, it just won't be used and then you'll know, okay, that one was, imp was an impertinent force. But there's no harm if it's on the diagram and you just don't happen to use it later. What you can't do is be missing any forces. If you're missing any forces, you're not doing the right problem. You're doing a different problem. You gotta have all the pertinent forces. So, let's talk about the types of forces we're going to see in here. So you'll recognize them in the problem and know how to apply them to the free body diagram so they're useful to you. You, you, you mess these up at all and it's just going to mess up the problem for you. You're going to get frustrated. I'm obligated by law to take points away, get the red pen out, starts flashing and slashing it all in place. Red because it looks like blood, like I'm drawing blood. So we got to get all the pertinent forces are. Uh, don't forget, when we're looking for forces, whether we're solving for them or we're applying them in a problem, these are vectors. So you've got to have all of the parts of a vector to do these problems right. What are the parts of a vector? The characteristics of a vector. There's three of them. Direction. Magnitude. And units. For the free body diagram, the direction and the magnitude are, are the most crucial. It's in the calculation itself where the units really come into play. But pay attention to all of them. So as we go through these forces, remember at any time, we're looking for as much as we possibly can about the direction and the magnitude of the forces. The more we can figure out ahead of time, the less we have to figure out later in the problem. The less work for you to do. The less work for you to screw up. Which means the less points you're gonna lose. All the better. All the better. All I'm trying to do here is, is keep you all your God-given points. All right, so some of the forces, not in any particular order, but some of the forces that we're gonna come across uh, in our class here. Um, things like pushes. Well, that's what the thrust was doing. It was pushing on the rocket. Uh, lots of problems we're going to see in here where somebody, uh, you can pretend it's you if you want, is pushing on an object to move it. Whether it's a crate or a, 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 a girlfriend or anything else. There's, there's, there's pushes. Generally, we don't know anything about the direction and magnitude other than what's given. And it may be nothing is given, but it may say uh, 
somebody's pushing on a crate with a 30 degree angle. Great, now you know the direction, now you know the angle, you just may not know the magnitude. Depends on how the problem's written. A lot of times though, we will know the direction. If you have a push on a problem and it's said it's at 30 degrees, it usually means something like that. That's good. Half of the part of that force vector is taken care of. You know the direction. It's acting on directly towards the object because that's how pushes work. And if they give you the angle, put it in. Look at the drawing if one comes with it. Look at the wording carefully. We'll have some forces like this. We'll have some that are level, some that are vertical. There's lots of possibilities. This is just one example. Poles. This is ropes. Strings, cables, chains, anything you might find in your bedroom goes there. Bill, was I missing anything that you want to throw on that list? You look like uh, that's not my list. <laughs> no? Okay, you're alright. The thing that's good about anything in a problem that pulls is you do know the direction of it. Because, well, ropes, strings, cables, chains can only pull. You can't push with a, a cable. I guess we could. you could get a rope, wet it, freeze it, and then push with it. But in general, any of these things attached to an object, it can only be a pull force. It can only be directed away from the object. So if we have some object and somebody's pulling on it with a rope, it's got to be a force away from the object. That's how pulls work. And only poles and the force is directed right along where the rope itself is pointing. You can't push with a rope sideways. You can't put a rope on something, be pulling on it and direct the object sideways. If you move sideways, well the rope moves sideways with you too and you're still pulling only in the direction the rope points. And along its own direction. So if you've got a rope, a string, a cable, a chain and a problem, you know that the force is away from the object in exactly that direction of the rope itself. It can't do anything else. That's great. That's that's all of the direction is already known. It's one less thing for you to have to figure out. If they tell you to find what's the force in the rope required to give it a certain acceleration, you already know the direction. You just have to work on the magnitude in that problem. Half of it's done. If you recognize ropes only pull, and they only pull in their own direction. So forces, uh, those kind of, th these are these are sort of uh, what we might call um, external, or a, maybe a better word is applied forces, because these are forces we have to come in and do something. We have to come in and push it. We have to come in and pull it. There's other forces we're going to have that just kind of happen because they're there.
All right, let's see. Some other forces. Let's see. All right. Oh, here, here's here's something you're doing right now. Let's figure out why. Here's you reduced to a simple free body diagram. This is how I see all of you. This, when I look out at the class, this is what I see. Bunch of blockheads. Oops, I did that out. <laughs> Mike's already quick dialing his lawyer. Um. Any forces on you right now? Well, of course. You're sitting here, you have some mass, and you're in a gravitational field, so you have weight. We know that forces on an object, forces on a mass, will cause that mass to accelerate. Why aren't you accelerating right now? there must be some force pushing back up against the weight that cancels it. That's the only way for the sum of forces acting on a mass, in this case you, to have no acceleration. If that's zero, then that must be zero. There's no other two ways about it. This F equals MA this is not a simplification, an estimation. This is the way it works. This equation has never been proven wrong. It's the way of the universe. So this side is zero, which it is. Not one of you is accelerating right now. The forces must sum to zero. So something's got to be missing here. There must be something pushing back up on you with exactly the same amount as your weight. There's just got to be. What is it? The chair. It's the chair. Actually, what it is, is the molecular forces of the chair. You're on the chair being pulled down by the earth. The earth is trying to pull you through the chair. The chair is fighting back with its own molecular forces. Materials in general don't like being torn apart. So all of those little forces in the chair are pushing back on you to hold themselves together. If you sit on a really weak chair where those molecular forces are too weak, you will accelerate. It's pretty funny when it happens. And I'm thinking sometimes it might be fun to bring in some, some trick chairs just to watch y'all accelerate. I love how he accelerated. But the administration asked me to stop doing that. So these chairs are stout enough to push back on you with enough force that they maintain their integrity and they counteract the weight. This is also uh, an example of Newton's third law. You're pushing down on the chair. The chair is pushing back up on you with an equal and opposite force. That's an action-reaction chair. Uh, sorry, force. Action-reaction pair. Your weight is pulling down on the chair. The chair is pushing back with the same amount. Not more, otherwise you take off. Not less, otherwise you'd go down. Just the right amount to leave you where you are. We call this the normal force. And typically give it the letter big N. Be careful because we also have big N for Newtons. This is the normal force. In physics and engineering, this word normal has a particular meaning. It's not the meaning, it's not the normal meaning of what you're thinking, where ordinary, it doesn't mean that at all to us in physics and engineering. It means one thing and one thing only. It means perpendicular. That's good. That 
gives you the direction. But I need to explain it more carefully. Perpendicular to what is the question? The normal force is a contact force. It only occurs when one thing is in contact with another. Your butt is in contact with the chair. If you stand up and you're off of the chair, there's no longer a normal force between you and the chair. It's gone. It's a contact force between two objects, between two surfaces. If those two surfaces are in contact, there's no normal force. Now, careful with that. I have students in problems, a lot of times will try to put a normal force in a problem just because they think there should be one there. But then they can't tell me what's the object it, the, <coughs> that's causing it. Where's that normal force coming from? It's the object we're talking about is not in contact with anything. If it's not in contact with anything, there's no normal force. That rocket problem we did, there was no normal force. That rocket wasn't in contact with anything. Not the way I laid out the problem. It's a contact force. The object causing the normal force can only push so that's what I drew here here's you here's the normal force coming from the chair as it acts on you it's only pushing so it's always directed towards the object It's only perpendicular huh, hard right way down there. Only perpendicular to the two surfaces in contact. So if you know where those two surfaces are, you know the full direction of the normal force. Only perpendicular to surfaces in contact. So you just look at a problem, see what surfaces are in contact, if any. You know the normal force is acting towards the object, because normal forces can only push, and you know it's perpendicular to the two surfaces in contact. That's really important because we've got to get this normal force right in these, just like we got any other force right, we're going to get the problem wrong. Here's an object on an incline. Two surfaces in contact? Of course. The box, whatever it might be, maybe it's still you, sitting on a slope. So we draw a free body diagram, I make it big. I try to give it the same amount of slant so the prop, the drawing helps me. It's got some weight. I figure. I didn't say where it was, but let's figure it's on the Earth or somewhere, some planet. The normal force. Let's see. It's a contact force. We do have two forces. A uh, surface is in contact. It's only a push, so it's only going to act towards the object. And it's only perpendicular to the surfaces that were in contact. There's the surfaces. There's the perpendicular. And I can draw the normal force. I might not know how big it is, but I know its direction. That's great. That's half the problem. You know its direction. T 
to figure out the magnitude of the normal force. There's only one thing you can do, and I don't know any other way to come up with the normal force than to do this. Draw it accurately on a free body diagram, and then sum the forces on the object. But normal force will be one of those forces, and that's how you can figure out its magnitude. There's no other way. Occasionally, occasionally, the normal force will be equal in magnitude to the weight of the object, but only occasionally. So do not assume that right into a problem or you'll screw up. Occasionally it happens, but not always. Let's see, let's, uh, let's do a little bit more with this problem. Um, there's got to be something keeping the box from actually sliding down the plane. You put a box on a slip slippery, greasy, icy Adirondack <coughs> hillside, it's going to slide down. So there's got to be something keeping it from sliding down. So let's say that is uh, some force parallel to the thing. Now let's say that's you, that's you. So that's F U. Charlie? It's not you, Mike? You couldn't do that because it would hurt your wrist? Alright. Let's uh, Let's let's figure out then. Let's say that's. Uh, let's put some numbers on here. Let's say the weight is. Uh, make it something nice and round. We'll say 200 newtons. Let's say this slope here, this incline, just to give it a nice fat round number is 30 degrees. Let's figure out how much force you need to exert to do this. Because we need to know, is Mike strong enough to do this? Or does he have to call in reinforcements? So let's figure out how big a force must you exert to hold the box there. Too much force, you'll push it up the hill. Not enough force, it'll go ahead and come down the whole hill. Remember, this is a greasy, icy, frictionless surface. Ooh, friction's a force. We just haven't talked about it yet. It's coming up. Um, is that a problem we could solve? How many unknowns are in this problem? How many things do we not know? Uh, well, we don't know the mass, but we're going to say if you know the mass, you know the weight. If you know the weight, you know the mass. We're not going to consider that an unknown. It's always W equals mg, so if you know one, you know the other. We'll take it as that. Make things a little simpler for our discussion. What do we not know in this problem? Because we need as many equations as we have unknowns and we couldn't solve it anyway. Mike, one thing we don't know. Yeah, we, we don't know the magnitude of this force. So there's one thing. We don't know the magnitude of that force. Do we know the direction of that force? Yeah, I said it's parallel to the slope, so we already know its direction. Remember, all forces are vectors. You've got to know direction and magnitude or you don't know the force. So there's one thing we don't know. We need the magnitude. Let's do the magnitude question mark, just to remind us we don't know it. So we need at least one equation. 
What else don't we know? You could say, well, I don't know what we don't know, and that way I guess you answered the question. What, Alan? The normal force. Well, no, no, no. It's perpendicular to the surface. So don't we know it? Huh? Yeah, we don't know the magnitude. We do again on this one. We know the direction because we know the surface, the angle of the surface. We don't know the magnitude here either. So there's two things we don't know. We need at least two equations to solve this problem. Anything else we don't know? I don't know. Oh no, we're caught in an infinite loop. Anything else we don't know? Let's see, we know the weight, we know the direction, not the magnitude, direction, not the magnitude, we know the... There isn't anything else we don't know. There's only two things we don't know. We only need two equations. I'll give you one, just to help. So here's one equation. What's the acceleration? Yeah, zero. We don't want it to accelerate in the problem. I said exert enough force so it stays put. So we know the acceleration here. We must know the sum of the forces. But to do that, we need some of the magnitudes of business too. So there's one equation that the sum of the forces equals zero. Substitute into what? We need a second equation. In terms, of the in terms of what other one? There's only one equation there. That's the this is the same equation here. But you have weight. Your job as undergraduates is to get as many equations as you have unknowns. That's your job. We have two unknowns. Maybe it helped if I numbered them. There's two unknowns. We only have one equation. I gave you that. Where is the, what's the other equation? No, I gave you the weight. That's a force. Sums right in there. We don't need the mass because it's not accelerating. So W equals mg is not an extra equation we need. We already got it. We don't need it anyway. We already got the weight. We don't need the mass, so W equals mg won't help us. What's the other equation? This is your job as undergraduates. You're, you're, you're failing at the one thing I need you to do, which is come up with as many equations as you have unknown. That's all the homework's ever been. Joe? What do you mean an equation for magnitude? This is the only force equation we've got. We don't have an equation for magnitude. Do we? We know it'd be nice if we did. The equation of magnitude. It's kind of like, like pulling out a great sword. Mike? Well, that's true, certainly. Well, okay, so so I can do trigonometry on this 30 degree angle, so what? Bill? I still don't have two equations. That's just mechanics, that's just algebra. That's why we let the math teachers teach that stuff. Where's the second equation? Oh, wait, you, you've had a turn. Give up? Do you surrender? You cry uncle? Do I have you in a headlock? Figuratively speaking? The product is being the two forces. 
zero. That's true, they're perpendicular, but again, that's just mechanics. All right, you give up? You want the second equation? Patrick does. Patrick, Patrick did about 20 minutes ago. Here's the second equation. There it is right there. This is a vector equation. All vectors have two things magnitude and direction, so that equation can handle two things at once. Here's how we do it. We break it into component directions. And then we use the sine and the cosine and the trig and the dot product if you want. And those are all the mechanics to actually do this. Remember when I told you in projectile motion that the two directions, the x, y directions, are kept separate. Same thing here. We keep the x and the y directions separate. There's things going on in both. There's intertwining between the two. That, you know, it's the same mass in each of these. But this is actually two equations So we can always handle two unknowns in our problems. We have two equations. The next question. What is the x direction? What is the y direction? Whatever you say. Remember the origin and the coordinate system that's arbitrary. You can set anything you want. That's not going to change the physics. That's, that's you. That's a human invention. So put X and Y wherever you want. Here's my advice. Take it or leave it. My advice is, if possible, put the X and Y directions in the direction of the unknowns you're looking for, or the unknown uh, parts. We don't know the magnitude of either of those. If we could put the x and y in those directions, that's just less complication. The answer is going to pop right out because that force, each force then is entirely in one of the directions. It's just easier. But you don't have to. You can put x and y anywhere you want. You don't even have to make them perpendicular if you don't want it. I think you'd be a fool if you didn't. But people of your age are fools sometimes. So my advice, if possible, look at the problem, put the component directions in the direction of the unknowns. Well, we know that well, we know the directions. We don't know the magnitude. So let's go ahead and line them up like that. That would work. That's okay. Another thing that does for us, only one of the forces is off angle. The other two are right on angle. They don't even have any angle to go into them. Cosine of 90 is 1. The cosine of 90, uh, sine of 90 is, uh, is 0. And everything's easier. Do not take this problem and re-tilt it so that there is no incline. Don't you dare do this. Anybody taught to do that in high school? International don't do symbol. Some of, I guess nobody here, I'm glad. Uh, some well meaning high school teachers will teach students to do this. It hasn't changed the problem any, except it's made it physically unrealistic. Because now where's the earth? 
not where I last saw it, which is right down there. It's now over there somewhere. And you now have a physically unrealistic problem. So I don't want to see that. And it doesn't sound like I'm going to if nobody learned that from their physics teachers. There's a reason that some teachers only teach high school. All right, so let's do this problem here. Um, sum the forces in the x direction. We'll determine our x acceleration, except we don't expect there to be any. All right, so uh, I like to write this down and then actually do the summing of the forces below. So I put this kind of as a header. It just, it just organizes things for me better. And generally, uh, we'll do so for you too. So let's see, any x forces, let's see. Uh, N isn't, it's a y force. It's perpendicular to the x direction, so it doesn't have any influence on the x direction. F U's there, but it's in the minus x direction. So I'll put minus F U, Charlie. Is that it? Uh, can't be it. If that was the only force in the x direction, we'd have x direction acceleration. Something must be opposing it. Huh? No, the, the normal direct vector is perpendicular to the x direction. Remember, these two directions don't mix. So if I have a force entirely in the y direction, it's not even going to show up here. So there's got to be some force opposing you. What is it? Well, notice that the weight is pushing a little bit in the x direction. Maybe I'll call that WX there. And a little bit in the Y direction. Maybe I'll call that WY. So I've taken the weight out and I've replaced it with its two component directions. That's just trigonometry. Now bring in your Sokotoa, Krakatoa, East of Java, or whatever that thing is, I don't even remember. <laughs> So, uh, Wx is opposing your force. In fact, if you weren't there, that's the force that's going to pull it down the plane. Because it's directed down the plane. We know those forces will sum to zero because there is no x acceleration. We know that. And you can look at the problem and tell there's no... I, I told you. I don't want the box to go anywhere. So the magnitude of Fu, let's see, so Fu equals minus Wx. That's just algebra. You can look and see, yeah, that, that follows out of the picture as well. Nice, big, free body diagram because we need to do this kind of stuff. We need to have room in there to break forces into its, their component directions. Is negative. They're in opposite directions. Oh, I already got the negative in here. So if I do the algebra, yeah. Is that what was bugging you? Yeah, Me too. Now we're okay. See, remember, uh, that was the directional stuff. What we're looking for now is the magnitudes, and so that'll that'll take care of itself now if we if we uh, keep our algebra just right. Do we know how big this is? Well, yeah, we would if we we know the magnitude of W. If we knew these angles, one of these angles, we'd be okay. We here's here's a here's a little helper for you. I invented this myself, this beautiful thing. 
this this helps us this represents any incline I want notice the weight always points straight down see the magic of that your eyes are getting heavy you're feeling asleep that's why I didn't make that shiny because you would have just conked right out and we could have made you bark like a dog and stuff and it'd be very funny <laughs> notice that any time I put an incline in, the normal force is always perpendicular to that incline. Remember, this represents an incline. So, let's see here. Here's horizontal. That's, uh, that's, that's about 15 degrees, isn't it? Notice that's the very same angle between the weight and the normal direction. So if you remember that, the incline angle is the same as the angle between the weight and the normal direction. You won't have to worry about it anymore. That's all you have to remember. And if you can't remember it, just visualize it or make a little sketch. So that 30 degrees is the angle between the weight and the normal direction. There's the normal, there's the normal direction. There's the 30 degrees. The weight is always the same angle as the slope from the normal direction. The normal is always perpendicular to the slope. So Wx is the hypotenuse W times, well you only have two choices, sine or cosine. Thirty degrees we're looking for this side here, but that's the same as this side here, which is the side opposite the 30 degrees. Again, this is why you need a big picture. Otherwise, you're not going to be able to see that well. You make a tiny little picture as if you're working for the post office designing stamps. There. You're not working for the post office, you're working for me. Nice big picture because there's a lot of stuff to get in here. This problem only has three forces in it. What if we had four or five? So be careful. So it's W sine 30. If you need help seeing that right triangle that we do our trigonometry on, Feel free then to turn your paper a little bit. You don't actually move the earth when you do that. You move the earth when you do this. That's what happened in New Zealand yesterday. Somebody did this in a physics class somewhere. New Zealand wasn't ready. We've got W. It's 200 newtons. Sine 30. Look it up. What is the sine of 30? One half. Huh? One half. One half? I'm going to do this in my head to show you how good I am with numbers. Ah, I didn't even do it right. Why was I thinking of 300? <laughs> oh, 30, I made it 300 in my head. Now I'm doing it again. Three, I'm still wrong. Oh, Jesus. 100. Trouble is, I'm in three, three different time zones up here. I, I just said something. I'm writing something and I'm thinking of what I'm going to say next. So I'm in three time periods at once. That's, that's how you screw up at the board. There we go. The magnitude of the force you need to apply. Uh, we need somebody, maybe it's Mike, maybe it's not, can push with 100 Newton force. That's about the weight of, of uh, 100 apples. Could you hold 100 apples? What? Road apples? It's a road apple. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you have to have you have to have had a horse to know what road apples are. Uh, I, I, 
Now you got it. He said. All right, and then sum the forces in the y direction, which we can do because we know the y acceleration is also zero. It's not going anywhere, y or x. And we can look at it, we're all done. N equals W cosine 30. We weren't asked for that, we were asked for this. But that was an unknown. All right. Uh, we got other forces to talk about. We'll do it real quick on Monday. Practice good free body diagrams. If I were you, oh, don't you love it when I say that? I'd bring in a, a little ruler or use a, your student ID or something. A, a straight edge can help with these pictures a lot and allow you to make bigger pictures accurately. Well done, my friend. Are you leaving any dirt this time? Thank <laughs> you.